We've been working for quite a while, guys. We tilled the soil and planted the seeds long before there was Alonzo and smart contracts, and even before there was Shelly and staking. Back in the Byron days, these things were all just hopes and dreams for the future, but we planted those seeds and we stuck to our guns about growing something that would look totally different than everything else in the cookie cutter EVM world. We've tended that field all these years, and now while our competitors drop off like dying locusts, it's harvest time for an EUTXO blockchain and all its bountiful fruits, including local state, fee determinism, concentrated liquidity DEXs to fight the scourge of impermanent loss, 5 million NFTs on chain that are actually native assets, and maybe even an algorithmic stable coin that doesn't implode. Ready? Yeehaw! Let's go! Thank you to at Joyous Testimony for the intro today. We are going to discuss the new IOHK article about why EUTXO is so much better at fighting impermanent loss, Cardano passing a big milestone in native assets, the Cornucopia's mint repricing, and a new JED FAQ from Coty that might answer some questions in the wake of Luna and UST. If you often find yourself doing that thing from the movie Gladiator where you run your hands over a golden field of grain with cool music playing in the background because you have found yourself in Elysium, or if you're liking these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. And we have recently had our best epic ever. We were supposed to mint something like 10.3 blocks. We actually minted 13, which uh, Ada Pools tells us is something like 126% luck. We've also surpassed 100 blocks. We've now minted 110 blocks. There seem to be a lot of eyeballs on Cardano right now, and for good reason. A lot of people seem to be losing faith in Ethereum's ability to miraculously reinvent itself, to rebuild the aircraft mid-flight, to suddenly become a proof-of-stake blockchain that does all the right things and none of the bad things on any kind of timeline that will matter in the crypto space. At the same time, a lot of other our other competitors are either downright imploding or falling ill due to elements that usually revolve around the long-term effects of Ponzi-nomics or the ills of centralization, either of validators or of token ownership or often both. While almost all of Cardano's competitors seem to be falling away, it seems like Cardano might be coming into some of its best days. And this article from IOHK highlights a couple of those things that people are most looking forward to in the near future for Cardano. And this article is a great article to take you from sort of zero understanding of the impermanent loss issue to uh, a pretty good understanding of why EUTXO is so much better at fighting impermanent loss than anything in the EVM world. So the article starts out, it gives you a good explanation of exactly what impermanent loss is, uh, how AMMs work versus order books. AMMs are kind of the design that's been necessitated by the account balance system in the EVM world, whereas order books are the same design, same architecture you're sort of used to in normal, the kinds of normal exchanges that we all used to kind of onboard to crypto. When you bought your first cryptocurrency, you probably used, if you didn't use some retail website, if you used an actual exchange, it was probably an order book that you encountered where you've got all of the offers to buy and all of the offers to sell that cryptocurrency listed right in the order book. It's a very straightforward design, a little bit easier to understand, I think, for the average person than kind of the complexity of an AMM. Again, AMMs were sort of necessitated by the needs of the EVM world more so than that they were like the, the most straightforward way to go about exchanging cryptocurrencies. So this article goes on to explain how in the EVM world, 
the scourge of impermanent loss comes about because you end up having to provide liquidity across the entire possible price range that the assets in the trading pair might encounter while your while your assets are deposited in that liquidity pool whereas in the EUTXO world where we can have normal order book designs you can make advantage of concentrated liquidity, which is a much more efficient system where instead of providing liquidity across the entire price range of both assets, or you can think of it as the price of the two assets relative to each other, you can just provide liquidity within a custom price range. You can say, hey, I'm going to suffer terrible and permanent loss in these price ranges, but in these price ranges, I'm comfortable with the small amount relatively smaller amount of impermanent loss I'm going to suffer. So I want to provide liquidity within this specific custom price range, not across the entire range of prices that these that this asset or these assets might encounter. This is something that's not possible to the same extent in the EVM world because you're just depositing your assets in a liquidity pool and then people are swapping and the price is going to go where it may. True, you could always pull your assets from the pool, but if you do that at a time when you're suffering so-called impermanent loss, people have unfortunately had to note that it becomes permanent loss. Fee determinism is kind of another similar advantage for EUTXO-based blockchains like Cardano. In the EVM world, you've got global state in EUTXO-based blockchains. You can make use of local state in Ethereum, because of this global state, you can't really have deterministic fees. So the situation where you go to submit a transaction, you think you know what the gas fees are going to be on that transaction, you submit the transaction, the gas fees aren't enough, and the blockchain may just decide to take your insufficient gas fees, you lose those fees, even though your transaction is not accepted by the chain. In Cardano's EUTXO system, this can't really happen because we have deterministic fees. You can figure out what the fees are going to be because of the local state. So you don't have to worry about this uh, variation, this fluctuation in fees that might result in the blockchain sort of stealing your fees without actually executing your transaction. We've talked about both these items on this channel before, but this article is a great explainer on both topics. And it seems like the rest of the crypto space is just barely starting to realize that some things like this are possible in Cardano because it's EUTXO. Things that have never really been possible in EVM-based systems that the rest of crypto, especially crypto DeFi, is so used to. The rest of the crypto space is also just waking up to the fact that Cardano has already minted 5 million NFTs on its blockchain. And this might have something to do with the fact that in Cardano, NFTs are native assets. You don't need smart contracts to mint NFTs in Cardano. It seems like a good case can be made that the simpler and more straightforward solution to a problem often has more adoption and longevity than the more complex solution to a problem, all other things being equal. And if one scenario is that you have to create a smart contract and then mint your NFTs versus just minting them as native assets, one of those definitely looks like the simpler and more straightforward solution to me. Cornucopias recently surprised a lot of people. They came out with some initial pricing for their, land, their upcoming land sale with a top end price that was quite a bit lower than the $5,000 figure they had been quoting for it seems like some months, but they just repriced again and they made the prices even lower. They said, Cornucopians, as a Cardano Metaverse project, we consider our community with each and every decision we make. We have already accomplished so many great things together and all of you are part of the Cornucopias vision. We also strive to continually bring in new members to the Cornucopias family, whether blockchain enthusiast or traditional gamer or both. With this community vision, our aim is to be as, in as inclusive as possible with every NFT sell. After extensive team discussions, we have decided to rebalance the pricing of our land mint. And here are the new prices. 
the small parcel will be $102. The medium parcel will be $210. The large parcel will be $310. The epic parcel will be $650. And the copious plot, the giant one, will be $1,000. You can see here in the old pricing from just a few days ago that the largest plot was $1,500. So this is a pretty significant reduction from 1500 all the way down to 1000. I think the interesting thing about here, I, I think this is a good I think this is a good well-motivated change. I think this is probably only going to make it even more difficult to acquire some of these plots. I thought it was going to be really hard to acquire the copious plot at 1500 given the small number that are going to be available and that what seems like a, a large number of people are going to be trying to get them, but at a thousand, five hundred bucks less than the original fifteen hundred or the previous fifteen hundred, I think it's going to be even harder to get any any of these parcels. I think they're all going to be super difficult to get now. Um, here's a little diagram showing the relative sizes. It looks like the medium plot is two point two five small plots. The large plot is four small plots. The epic plot is equivalent to nine small plots. And the copious plot is equivalent to 16 small plots. So quite a range from sort of 1x to 16x in terms of size. But I think no matter what the sizes are at these prices, I'm, I'm imagining it's going to, be, going to be very difficult to pick up some of these, you know, sort of like smaller allocation, larger size plots. I hope I'm completely wrong about that, but the history has been that I don't think we've seen any cornucopias mints where demand didn't heavily outstrip the supply. I think we've all kind of been waiting for Cody to give us sort of their definitive explanation about how Jed is going to be different. Jed is going to be an algorithmic stablecoin that doesn't implode like UST. I wasn't sure if this would come in the form of something written like this or if it would just be somebody like Shahaf Bargeffin of Koti um, explaining in interview form or presentation form why Jed was different. I'm glad they did it like this in FAQ format. I think this was sort of the perfect way for Koti to sort of differentiate Jed from UST and that whole legacy of algorithmic stablecoins. So this is a great article, and it's pretty straightforward. So they start out explaining what stablecoins are. They talk about three categories of stablecoins, fiat collateralized stablecoins, crypto collateralized stablecoins, and algorithmic stablecoins. They tell you that Jed is an over collateralized algorithmic stablecoin that is backed by crypto. Then they give you a good explanation of exactly what an algorithmic stablecoin is. And then they get into exactly how Jed works. We've talked about this a number of times going back a lot of months, but I think this is actually the definitive, most straightforward explanation of exactly how Jed works. So they talk about the fact that there's a liabilities pool and an equity pool. And the equity pool and the liability pool will form a collateral ratio in the range of 400 to 800%. That means that for every one ADA in the liabilities pool, there will be three to seven ADA in the equity pool in order to keep that ratio between 400 and 800%. There's a little diagram here that shows people buying and selling Shen and buying and selling Jed with ADA in both the equity and the liabilities pool. But the really interesting diagram, I think, is this diagram here. I've talked about this a number of different times, but I think this diagram is a very good way to show this visually. So you've basically got four different things that can happen. You can mint and burn Jed, and you can mint and burn Shen, exactly as you can see up here, the minting and burning of Jed and the minting and burning of Shen. So when the reserve ratio is 400 to 800%, that scenario where you've got three to seven ADA in the equity pool for every one ADA in the liability pool, when that's the case, you can do all four things. You can mint and burn Jed. You can mint and burn Shen. If you're above 800%, if things are too over collateralized, then of course you can mint or burn Jed, but you can only burn Shen. They don't want you minting any more Shen because they're already over collateralized. They don't need any more Shen holders. If 
they're under collateralized, if they're below that 400% uh, collateral ratio, then they won't allow anyone to mint any more Jed. They'll just allow people to burn Jed. They will allow people to mint Shen because they want to be more collateralized, but they won't allow anyone to burn shed. This Shen, this is fundamentally different than the ratio we've seen with a lot of other algorithmic stable coins, where these types of actions weren't really forbidden in these kinds of these kinds of ratios. What we've seen in the past is that algorithmic stable coins sort of entered this death spiral where people keep doing the thing that you wouldn't want the, you wouldn't want people doing if you're trying to maintain the peg. In the case of being under collateralized, that would be just continuing to, in this case, like burn more and more Shen and minting more and more Jed. And that's really how Koti is distinguishing Jed from something like UST. In the case of Jed, if you're under collateralized, if the collateral ratio, I guess you're still over collateralized by 400%, but if the collateral ratio drops below 400%, you simply can't mint any more Jed and you can't mint or you can't burn any more Shen. At least the, the uh, protocol would block you from doing those things anytime you're below 400, 400% collateral ratio. This is an important detail here. They say at at this 400% collateral ratio, the protocol can tolerate an instantaneous crash of 75% in the price of the underlying asset, which is ADA. That's an important, that's an important uh, ratio to look at. I think that's going to be important to people considering, uh, considering participating in this protocol, whether or not they think this is a, su a sufficient, sufficient enough um, sort of cushion a 75 percent crash in the price in the price of ada when you come down here at the bottom of the article they actually have a whole section just sort of uh specifically laying out why they think jed is so different from ust and they come right out and tell you what we just talked about although jed and ust are both algorithmic stable coins only jed is over collateralized and can prevent a death spiral by blocking the burning and minting of coins they also point out that in addition, the base token ADA is not minted when JED is burned. So even if the price of ADA decreases, the total supply of ADA won't increase as happened with Luna. I'm really glad to see this article from Koti. I hope you are having a great week and I will talk to you tomorrow.